Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to touch on the objectives of the day's, the morning session. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the function of the skin. I want to you guys to give that one some thought, and then to review some prevention, prevention of both pressure ulcers and skin tears, to look at options in the assessment and actually management of skin tears as well as pressure ulcers, and then we're going to talk about pressure management options because that's, of course, so important to prevent further damage. So the skin is the largest organ in our body. It's actually absolutely essential for temperature control, for feeling, or having sensation, for being able to shift position to reflect pain, and for electrolyte balance, which of course is essential to life. Um, it is our greatest protector, and honestly, we're 70% water. So without our skin, we would be a puddle on the floor. So our skin actually, um, the functions of it are, so it protects us from bacterial entry. And I know that all of you that work in healthcare hear all about hand washing and hand hygiene and how important it is. But honestly, the best prevention from sharing infection is in skin integrity, the, the skin integrity on your hands. Because when your skin is broken down, when it's open, it's an open portal for bacterial entry. And I want you to think about if you've ever known anyone who's been burnt. The biggest thing they need to do initially after a burn injury is, of course, wrap them in something to maintain temperature because their skin is missing. They also lose tremendous amounts of fluid, huge amounts of fluid, and a ton of protein. So all of those things are essential when you think about the maintenance of life. So when you just thinking about what happens when you lose your skin in such a traumatic incident, really it starts to make you understand a little bit more about how protective it is. It protects us from toxins, things like chemicals. Without our skin between us and the environment, we would be far more challenged to maintain hom our homeostasis. It, I mentioned fluid balance. We're a huge percentage of our body fluid, or our body is water. It provides for that sense of touch. Nurses are famous for their sense of touch. But when you introduce yourself to somebody, what's the first thing you do? Is you shake their hand. If I had psoriasis, eczema, or some other kind of skin integrity issue, am I likely to be able to socially interact comfortably with them? What about looking, you're, you guys are all looking at my face. I mean, my skin, unfortunately, is, is not too bad, but um, you know, it's such an integral part of you being able to interact with other people. So you need to, we need to think about that. Um, if someone has a skin integrity issue, it's very, um, challenging to be socially interactive, to go out in public. And if you ever had acne, you know how we don't want to have that pimple when we have go to a Christmas party. Um, and it really does keep underlying tissues from drying out. So if, if we didn't have skin, if you lose that first layer of skin and the tissue underneath dries out, it loses integrity. So the skin of my hand, this epidermis here, is avascular. Okay, the only, this skin that you're just looking at on the outside of me is, has no skin, has no blood connection to it unless it's fed by the underlying tissue, which is the dermis. And that's where the blood supply comes from. So that's important to understand when we think about when we lose that first layer of skin. So if there is a skin tear. So skin protection, there are lots of things to consider when you're thinking about skin protection. And you guys are in an occupation when you're moving people all the time. You're moving them in lifts. You're standing them up from wheelchairs. You're bringing them across and turning them on bed surfaces. And when that happens, friction can be a real issue. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about all of these things. Moisture, nutrition, fluid intake is so important. Hot, dry skin is much more prone to breakdown, and hydration is so important to skin integrity. Um, and we're going to talk about sensation. I mentioned it briefly. We'll talk some more. And some possible sources of pressure and trauma. But when I list those first six things, those are the things on your Braden scale. So when you're actually doing that MDS quarterly, when you're actually collecting data, when you're looking at individuals' risk of pressure ulcer, those are the things that matter. So those are why we talk about those. So friction, 
and you know everybody has had a blister on their foot from improperly fitted shoes, that's friction. It's the rubbing of the skin causing a decrease in the skin's protective ability. So when you think about when you turn someone on the bed and you drag them across the sheet, you're not meaning to injure them, but their skin against that sheet can actually cause a friction injury. Um, poor fitting socks or shoes, so you've got those lovely ribs and socks across the toes and I know those are quite irritating to my feet. And so those are sources sometimes of friction as your foot moves in your shoe. The other things that we sometimes forget about are medical devices like casts. Casts are, can be a tremendous source of friction if you're actually trying to maneuver across beds and weight bear or shift your weight in them, and prostheses. So sometimes the damage that I've seen on people are, is, is stump damage because they're, trying, they're wearing a prosthesis. And are you looking at their stump and the inside of that prosthesis? Is there a source of friction there? So there are just some things to think about. The other thing that sometimes is a real issue is a lot of um, residents in long-term care, unfortunately, are incontinent. So uh, when we cleanse them, when we bathe them, when we do perineal cleansing, are we scrubbing? Scrubbing is a tremendous source of friction. Is that causing traumatic skin loss? So some of the things to reduce that are using barrier creams. So when you're, you're not removing their skin when you're cleaning them. Um, and using particularly um, perineal cleansers. That's what they're designed for. And also when you're cleaning, use hot, uh, warm, not hot water. And try not to scrub people. They don't typically, they, they d actually people don't get that dirty. They just, they need to be cleaned with some gentle, um, some gentle care. So shear, shear is a force that's produced when we slide across an adjacent surface. So when I think about shear pressure, I think about when we, we're so diligent at getting people up to the top of their bed when we're raising, you know, so that they're not sliding, so that when they have to have breakfast or something. So the two of us will bring people up, we'll slide them to the head of the bed, and then we crank that head of the bed up. Well, now their skin often, because sometimes they don't have a whole lot on behind there, uh, their skin actually is a bit sweaty or a bit damp, especially if they're wearing a pad. That skin sticks to whatever surface that their weight is sitting on. Then we crank the head of that bed up, their skin stays in place and their bones shift down because of gravity and they tear tissue off of bone. So a big thing when you're looking at sheer damage is where is that person's seat bones or their hips on the bed? They should line up with where, what I call the gatch. So the gatch is where the head of the bed comes up. So there, you should be lining their hip bones up with that area that comes up. And so that it's just below. Otherwise they just slide down and it causes all kinds of problems. So one of the nursing homes I worked at in the city here, what I did is I went through and actually marked the gatch on the bed for the CCAs so they actually knew where to put them. And that can make a tremendous difference because it actually causes ischemic changes when that, when that torsion occurs. And that's what causes um, undermining, actually, and pressure ulcers. So the other thing that really causes problems is moisture. And of course, I mentioned a lot of our clients are, um, have issues with continence. Moisture actually allows bacteria to penetrate the skin, and it can change the pH of the skin, which it makes it much more susceptible to damage. Our skin doesn't tolerate moisture for very long, and the wetness destroys its natural barrier to bacterial infection. So sources of moisture, you guys know, are urine, liquid feces, drool, sweat. Wound drainage is another one. And the way to protect individuals from that generally is barrier creams. Um, anything that puts, that stops that drainage from sitting directly on skin will help to protect it. But I will mention that actually, um, as, as Kathy mentioned, I have some advanced training in wound healing. And one of the studies that I looked at at one time was a study on healthy medical students. Most medical students are pretty young, pretty healthy, have pretty, intact skin and what they did is they took these medical students, they wrapped their arm, one arm with a moist cloth, wrapped saran wrap over that to trap the moisture in and within 48 hours, actually might even been 24, they had overgrowth of pseudomonas on that intact skin. So moisture by itself will create a medium for infection. So it's so important that we actually protect that skin from moisture. Nutrition. I'm not a dietitian, 
but nutrition and hydration are extremely important to skin health as well. I mentioned if someone got burnt and they lose their skin, they lose protein, a ton of protein. That protein needs to be replaced. So generally, you, the dietitians get involved very hopefully as early as possible, and you're looking at double the protein intake when you have a chronically draining wound. Um, basically, protein contains albumin. Albumin is a tissue building block. So when someone's albumin gets too low, they can't grow tissue anymore. It's quite a simple process, actually. Um, and that balanced diet that I mentioned there of vegetables, meat, and fruit that's necessary for general health. In 1957, they created Canada's Food Guide, and it is still the best resource out there. So when you have somebody that asks you how they should be eating or what they should be doing, that's the guide that we should offer them if we don't have a dietitian readily available. That's still the best thing going. Hydration is so important. If any of you, all of you know how cold dries out your skin in the winter, well, hydration is also very important when we work in institutions. They're very, they actually don't have a very high humidity level generally, partly because of infection control issues. But when our skin dries out, it cracks. And cracks are a portal for infection. So it's really, really important that we use moisturizers after bathing. And usually when the skin is still damp, that's when they're best absorbed. So that's another thing to consider. But um, essentially what I also want to mention is one of the things I'm doing right now is actually working on a hydration project in a long-term care facility as a clinical, clinical faculty member. And generally, we're finding that most residents in long-term care are underhydrated, and it causes lots of issues. And a minimum hydration level is 1,500 mils a day. That's what we put on people as a fluid restriction. I challenge you to actually track how much they're drinking, because most of them are not even getting 1,500 mils a day. And if we're not giving them that, um, we actually can create um, some issues with skin integrity. Also, thickened fluids are a big barrier to adequate hydration. So when you have individuals in your facility that are on thickened fluids, that's something as well to consider. So sensation, obviously insensate individuals that are at increased risk of tissue loss, and because pain is a protector. When we're sitting here listening to me talk, most of you will be not even realizing you're shifting in your chair in response to discomfort. But so it's a really important protection. But the other thing, we all know about quads and paras and those individuals being at risk of skin injury, but who have we thought about individuals that are sedated? When we sedate people, we minimize their pain sensation. We put them at potential risk for injury. Also individuals with dementia. Can they articulate pain? So it's really important when you're doing that braid and scale that individuals with dementia, individuals that are on pain medication because of long-term arthritis, because of cancers, because of other things, that we consider that as, and score them lower on the braid and scale because that indicates a risk and you're always better off to go low. So when we talk about assessing tissue damage, in particular in this case in response to skin tears, one of the, there are some risk factors. And I think most of you probably know these risk factors because you probably deal with a, uh, a population that you see this a lot. And that's why we're having this conversation. So of course, advanced age is a risk. And we're going to say over 80. Uh, you know, is when this t things start to get more likelihood of risk injury. But also immature skin is mentioned there, and that's simply because neonates are also at very high risk. Um, compromised nutrition. Malnutrition not only affects your ability to grow tissue, but it also um, affects your ability to maintain skin integrity. So it's really important that we actually think about that. And there was a study, a national study done, and one of the sites was Regina. And when they looked at, it was a malnutrition task force, it was a Canadian study, and in, uh, across hospitals, they found that there was 42% of in-hospital patients were malnourished while they were in institution. And I know that long-term care facilities are generally better than that, but are we absolutely sure that people are eating? Are they able to eat? Do they have teeth? There's so many things to think about that we sometimes assume that they get the food because it's in front of them. Cognitive impairment is a big issue. We lose sensory impairment with, along with dementia. So they, of course, are of increased risk, right? And often they're sometimes combative. And so when we're trying to 
hold down someone who's got very thin skin, we increase their risk of injury. So it's important to recognize that that's a risk factor. Multiple medications. Anybody that's on long-term steroids, like rheumatoid arthritics, um, have a very thin skin, very high risk of skin tears. And individuals on blood thinners don't have thinner skin, but it takes less trauma to cause something like a hematoma. And of course, that hematoma has the potential to cause skin breakdown. So it does. Individuals that are on things like warfarin will have all those lovely purple bruised areas that indicate that they're much more prone to skin tears and skin loss. Impaired mobility, of course, is another risk because when the more we maneuver people or have to maneuver them around and use devices, the more likelihood of skin damage. Dry skin and dehydration come up again. Sensory impairment. When you have an individual that has a sensory impairment and, for example, someone with diabetes that doesn't have good sensation to their feet, they lose balance, they lose proprioception. When people lose proprioception, they increase risk of falling. That, of course, again, increases risk of traumatic injury. And chronic disease. Not only renal failure uh, causes things like dry skin, which are risk issues, but also the edema. When you have edema to lower tissue, you've got tissue pressure, you have less blood flow, and of course, if there's an injury, you are much more likely to have a blister, and the blister can go on to cause a skin tear. So all of those things really increase our issues and our risk. Then it actually just the need of having to have someone else mobilize you puts people at greater risk of bumping them on a piece of equipment, on the wheelchair, on the walker, against the commode, and all of those things also put people at, uh, put individuals at risk for pressure ulcers as well. So the risk factors aren't that different. So when we talk about preventing skin tears, first of all, recognize those individuals that have fragile skin. That I mentioned that purple bruised areas, you've all seen it, it's called ecchymosis. Um, and when, so when their skin is thin, <clears throat> we really need to teach, especially the home health, or sorry, the CCAs, about using caution when bathing and dressing those individuals because that skin, most skin tears occur during those ADLs. Um, really important to think about short nails, no rings with stones, all of those things that you think about when you're handling anybody, it's completely dependent on your help. And really trying to avoid the risk of traditional tapes. There's microadherent tapes that are out there. It's, one of them is called Mepitac, and I don't have a sample of it, but it's a brown tape. It's actually, um, if you look at the border of this particular dressing, it's a Mepilex border, that edge is the same thing as Mepitac. Okay, so that type of tape, use it all the time in the neonatal unit here. If you have somebody who's really prone to skin tears, that's a really good option. And paper tapes are actually also still a good option. But just remembering that we have to be so careful of any tape on their skin. So skin tear management, there's actually a flap of skin remaining, then we really need to try and roll that back and skin will reattach. You guys all know about grafting, well it's really not that different. Because remember I said the external skin is the epidermis, it's avascular. If we can reattach it to the vascular bed in the dermis, sometimes it will reattach and they'll have less issue. So there's three categories of skin tears, and there is actually a classification system called the Payne-Martin classification system. So a category one is a skin tear without loss. So that's one where they can actually bring the edges of the skin back together, either surgically and close them, or it can be manually rolled back. But for heaven's sakes, if you have any opportunity to share any information with a physician, ask them not to stare strip that flap because that's where we'll, can, we'll lose it because the, the scary strip will rip it off. Um, category two skin tears are when you have a partial tissue loss. So you're able to bring some skin back over, but you still have a significant open area. And category three are the one in the picture where there's actually, actually no skin that's actually remaining on top of that wound. 
So anytime you have that exposed dermis, it's extremely fragile. And so we need to be very careful how it's cleansed. And that's when we're going to talk about that twist off or dual top saline held four to six inches away. Some of the uh, facilities are also using sea cleanse, which is perfectly acceptable. Hold it the same distance, cleanse it well, and don't rub it. Don't scrub it or rub it with a two by two, dry the edges, and then you apply a dressing. We are, those are isotonic solutions that you can leave sitting moist on tissue. If it's sutured, of course, you just use a moist two by two and cleanse the suture line like you would any other sutured injury. The other thing then is there's non-adherent dressings that can be put over that, and I think most of you are probably familiar with Mepitel. Okay, that's the one I, that is one of the ones that's the most common. There's another one that I'll actually mention and I don't have a sample of it. It's called Adaptic. And Adaptic is actually a, um, was Smith and Nephew, and I'm sorry, Cystogenics product. Um, those are essentially no stick dressings. That's what you want because you don't want to cause any more damage, right? So what we'll do is we put something like a Mepitel on and then you cover it with some kind of an absorbent dressing if that's what you require. When you, if it's on a limb, if it's on an arm, which is probably the most common place I've seen skin tears, you actually should fasten that in place with Cling, Curlex, Burn Net, Surgilast, anything that doesn't put tape on the skin. So when you, you know, because that is what's going to cause more injury. Try as well to leave that dressing intact for as long as possible. If you want a skin flap to re-adhere, we leave grafts in place for quite a period of time before the initial dressing change. Same principles apply. You want to try to leave it for as long as possible. At least the contact layer. If the cover layer, if there's sufficient drainage and the cover layer has to be replaced, the Mepitel can stay in place for 14 days. Okay, so you can change the cover dressing and leave that in place underneath. And that's important if you're going to get flap readherence. The other thing is if you've rolled that flap back with a moist Q-tip and you've applied a dressing and you, now your flap is unidirectional. So you need to indicate on the outside of the dressing which way to remove it, because if they pull it off the wrong way, they're going to re-injure or re-lift that flap. So put an arrow on the outside, telling your partners which way to go. Um, the other thing to consider, it's re that bleeding can also be a significant issue. Remember, we talked a lot of individuals are blood thinners. So I just want to mention that there is a type of dressing it's actually called a calcium alginate, but it's called, the one on uh, Health Pro is called Cesorb. So this is actually a dressing that creates hemostasis, which means so it, for, it helps blood to clot. Because sometimes what happens is injuries continue to be problematic when bleeding won't stop. So you, you basically pull this out like I'm doing. You don't need a lot, you thread it on, you lay it on that tissue, and then the next time you go to change, it's biodegradable. So you can actually irrigate it off. You don't need to worry about picking it off. And it will coagulate that blood and get you on the road towards healing. So it's a really important thing to be aware of. But the biggest thing is leaving that dressing in place as long as possible. If you're using the Adaptic, I mentioned it, it's basically a, a Vaseline impregnated tool. It unfortunately has to be changed daily. So what I'm going to say to you is if you're needing a non-stick dressing because you've got someone who's got a flap you're trying to leave intact, but you're not sure that the rest of your colleagues are familiar with length of time for Mepitel, because you don't want it changed daily. It's a very expensive dressing. You can use the Adaptic, but just be really clear on which one you're using, how long it stays in place and uh, how to go forward so that you're not A, wasting money, or B, taking things off that don't need to be removed. A couple of other dressing options, because here we're looking at silicone dressings. Silicone dressings are that non-stick dressing designed for fragile skin. So there is a Mepitel <coughs> foam without the border. It's called Mepitel XT. Essentially, what this is, is that same backing as the Mepitel, it's the same contact layer in a foam. So what you could do is you could put that directly on the wound and then put your arrow on top and then take that directly off. And then you would just replace the one dressing and you'd fasten it in place again with a burn net or, or something that wasn't taped if that was where, 
Okay. Uh, the last one is the Mep Meplex border, and I think everybody in, is aware of that. Again, it's that same backing for fragile skin, but it's got the border, so you don't need to worry about any tapes. I will say to you, though, if you're putting this on an area where there is any kind of pressure or warmth, so if it's the back of a leg or something, I've found that this gets very, very tacky, very sticky, so it can cause some problems to remove. So just be aware of where you're putting it, how you're going to remove it, how long is it going to stay in place, Think that all through before you apply a dressing. And do minimize dressing change. It's so important to promote moist wound healing. It's so important to maintain warmth. Wounds, uh, cell, cells stop regenerating at about 28 degrees centigrade. We take that dressing off, we cool that wound down. We then spray it with a cool solution, we cool it down even more. So we don't get tissue regeneration in an ice in ice. So, you know, we really have to promote warmth. And so leaving that dressing intact helps that skin adhere, but it also maintains the warmth and increases cell re regrowth. Okay. So some key points, recognition of risk and prevention of injury in people at risk of skin tears is so important. And we really need to find ways to minimize ongoing trauma to skin tissue by minimizing dressing changes as well as tape removal. So we can also think about resident scratch themselves. I mentioned short nails in, your, in the workers, but sometimes you'll have someone who scratches themselves at night. And so putting gloves on them overnight when they're, probably, when they're at high risk of self-injury is also a really good idea. Um, and just thinking about what are the things that are causing the problem. So we're going to shift a little bit and talk about pressure ulcer prevention. So I've talked about a lot of the things that the Braden Scale does mention, things like sensation, moisture, mobility, activity, nutrition, and friction and shear. But looking is one of the most important things that you can do. So when you've got someone who's dependent on you for movement, and you're turning them or repositioning or, or taking braces off or putting things back on like prosthesis, it's really important that we look before that we do that to ensure that the skin is intact at the time that they're being moved. So it can't really overstress that. And so pressure is caught, pressure ulcers are caused by pressure. That's the reason. Okay, they're caused by pressure. So they're over bony prominences. So here's a, uh, some pictures of all of the origins of where that can be. But when I talk about that, I also want you to think about the fact that other things can cause pressure. So generally when we talk about pressure ulcers, we're looking over any kind of bony prominence. But I've had people that came home from a hospital that had a pressure ulcer in a very unusual location. And it's a very unusual shape. And I asked, what happened? And he told me that he was a quad who laid on his earphones, his headphone one night and nobody recognized that it was underneath him. That caused a significant pressure ulcers. Oxygen tubing can cause pressure ulcers. So medical devices can also be a real problem. So as much as we are all thinking about bony prominences and things, it's anything you're sitting or laying or standing on. So the heels on the wheelchair, the heels against the bed, all of those things are really high instance of pressure. So how do we maintain skin? We look, we inspect frequently for signs of any kinds of pressure, and we're looking for redness. We're looking for swelling, we're looking for a change in the skin texture, integrity, the feeling of it. So what you're doing is if you have two hips, we have two hips, two shoulders, two heels, look at one and then look at the other. Um, hopefully one of them isn't, they don't, don't, don't both have injury, but compare. So then you know if there's a change in turgor, you know if there's a change in temperature, you know if there's anything different. Um, and if you do see something red, you can actually attempt to blanch it. So what you do is you take your, your finger and you actually push down firmly on that reddened area of tissue and you hold for a few seconds and you release. If that tissue doesn't blanch, you have a stage one pressure ulcer. And that's one of the most frequently missed sources of injury. Um, if there's an area of redness, get them off it, reposition them, go back, review, and take a look. Um, and one of the things I have to mention is not rubbing reddened areas. I'm 
not new to this profession. I grew up at a time when we actually did rub red and Darius. But if you stop and think for a minute, that area is red in response to an ischemic change. We've just put a ton of pressure on that area. So what's happening is when we take them off, we've caused ischemia. That's what causes pressure damage. When we roll them off it, that redness is vasodilation. That vasodilation is a response to that ischemia. And those little capillaries that are un right underneath the skin are maximally dilated. We take our hand and we rub that, we actually cause a ton of capillary and vascular damage. So please do not rub reddened areas. We just, we cause all kinds of shear injury when we do that. Just observe, okay? So we're gonna actually walk through the stages of pressure ulcers at this point. So I've kind of given it away. A stage one injury is an observable color change of intact skin. So that's why it's often missed, because it's not actually an open area. So it's that persistent reddened area that doesn't blanch in response to fingertip pressure. And when we did do a prevalence study in long-term care several years ago, in response to some work the region was doing, we found that this was the most under-recognized pressure ulcer that there was. And the issue with that is if you don't recognize that initial pressure damage, and you don't respond and react to it and start reviewing all the pressure sources, that tissue will continue to break down. So it's really important that we recognize things early. So stage two pressure ulcer is actually that partial thickness skin loss. But when I say that, it can also be a blister. Because what happens, a blister is where your epidermis separates from your dermis. So it's now lost that vascular bed, that lost contact with that vascular bed. So it will slough. So it is an, it is an actual stage two pressure ulcer when you see a blister and or that shallow, shallow injury. So just that first layer of epidermis is gone. It's a very shallow wound. It's a very superficial wound. Um, it, but unfortunately, it can be the precursor to other things. But it's very important, again, to recognize staging is quite subjective. So it's to try, it, what we have to realize is that once we start having depth, it's beyond stage two. That's probably the most important thing that I can share with you about that. Stage three injuries are where you have full thickness injury with or without undermining. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about undermining later. But, so essentially what I'll tell you about that, the fastest way to figure that out is if you can insert a Q-tip into that and if there's any depth at all, it's a stage three injury, okay? Does that make sense? Because you need to recognize that it, it is a very subjective thing. And we do only stage pressure ulcers. I always have to say that if you have an injury that's not related to pressure, it would be, and it's say on a shin, for example, it's considered when it's a very shallow injury or a very initial injury, like a stage two pressure ulcer, we consider partial thickness wound, and anything with the depth is considered full thickness, just for clarification, okay? And stage four is that full thickness wound right down to bone, tendon, and underlying or supporting structures. And I'm gonna mention one thing now, is when we stage wounds initially, so if someone, say Mary in room 204, has a stage four pressure ulcer, and it begins to heal because we've done a really good job, Mary never has anything other than a stage four pressure ulcer. There's a lot of issues with M MDS about backstaging, and really we should recognize the full depth of that injury because that tissue has to regrow back from bone or tendon or joint. So if we backstage, if we now say three months from now it's a stage three, what we negate is the level of injury. And pressure ulcers have an 80% chance of re-breakdown, or sorry, never get past back past 80% of their original tensile strength. So they have a very high risk of re-breakdown. So if we don't recognize the degree of damage and we don't respond to that and we don't really protect for that, we have much more likelihood of re-injury because what that wound refills with is scar tissue. And scar tissue is much less vascular. So it's really important that we understand, recognize, and call it a spade a spade. So it would be a, a healing stage four pressure ulcer. 
And it's something that's really missing in the documentation, but that we have to recognize. And our final stage I'm going to mention is stage X. So if there is necrotic tissue, if there's eschar, if there's slough, if there's anything obscuring the granular bed of that wound, you cannot assess the depth. You must call it a stage X wound, X wound. And once it's debrided, if you have a physician that can debride it or you use of some other source that you that actually it may debride itself, depending on the nature of the dressing you're using, then you can once see once you can see that red granular bed, you can actually assess it for stage and stage it. But you really cannot do that when the wound bed's obscured. So there's one other type of pressure injury, and these are the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Scale. That's who state who creates those stages. And that, there's a new uh, type of injury that we're actually lining up with pressure, and that's called a suspected deep tissue injury. I think probably most of you have seen that boggy purple heel. It's blistered. It's mushy. It really looks unhealthy. If you've ever had somebody um, in your past come back from the OR after laying on an OR table for a period of time and somebody wasn't paying attention, they can come back with that lovely heel injury. So it's that purple, localized, discolored, intact skin or a blood-filled blister that's due to damage of the underlying soft tissue from pressure or and or shear. So it may be preceded uh, by tissue that's painful, firm, mushy, boggy, and warmer than the adjacent tissue. Sounds horrible? It is. These are the types of wounds when you see them that you will, you will see breakdown. The skin will slough off. It's not your, if you, they come to you with that injury, you haven't created the pressure injury after the fact. Those are things that I think of are almost like a blowout wound, um, where the damage is also actually really deep underneath and it will declare itself. So I'm gonna, I do love to tell stories and I'm gonna mention to you, I, I worked recently in a medical unit and we had a lady that came in to us that very hypothermic because she'd spent the last 48 to 72 hours in a bathtub. She'd fallen in her bathtub at home, um, was found by her neighbor when she pounded on the wall. And when she came to us, I said to the nurses, keep an eye on her backside because if you've been laying on hard porcelain for two days, you're going to have a pressure ulcer. And of course, she was also very cold. And so we watched. It took quite a long time. She had quite an area of, of as you can imagine, of bruising. And it started out with a reddened area that didn't look like much, but it developed into a stage four wound. That wound was there before she arrived. And that's why I wanted the really clear documentation that it actually occurred as a result of a lengthy stay in a bathtub pre-admission. Those are, I, I mentioned blowout wounds. Those are typically when you have a bruise to the bone, it, the bone will bleed and it will force, it will force tissue, it's tissue damage that's so deep that you'll actually slough off eventually because the tissue above that will die. And so that area will open up, but it's as a response to long-term unrelenting pressure. And then eventually you will see it declare. So suspected deep tissue injuries will often be very awful wounds. And usually I've seen them on heels, and heels are the most difficult area to heal. They have far less vascular supply. They're far more likely to be very recalcitrant wounds or very difficult wounds to heal. They're also very prone to shear because the people scrubbing their heels on the bed, and you get shear pressure, shear or friction, coupled with pressure, it really exacerbates the pressure injury. So what prevents pressure ulcers? I think I've basically talked a lot about looking, but I can't say that enough. Whenever you're turning people, whenever you're doing uh, any kind of ADLs, whenever people are being transferred uh, off a commode, um, we need to be looking at how long they were sitting there. Are there any reddened areas that are prone to any injury? Is there any area of skin that we think could be damaged? Um, a result of damage. Again, recently had a, a lady that I visited in one of the long-term care facilities who came in and uh, one of the nurses said, you know, she has a pressure ulcer. Of course, she'd had a fall 
she came in um, because she'd had a hip fracture. And they said to me, they, they thought she had a pressure ulcer. And I'm very sad to say that when I went in and looked at her, that there was a ring across her, co her coccyx, so right around from one gluteus maximus to the other in a ring of what looked like probably post-blistered tissue. So it was a dark purple discoloration with some very superficial skin loss. So it's a stage two pressure ulcer, uh, which is a critical incident that has to be reported. So we reported that as a critical incident. I wrote that up because the NP in the long-term care facility had identified that there was a concern because of the hospital. And the staff there told us that there was no documentation in their notes to indicate that there had been a problem. I went, oh. And when we went in to look and I saw this lovely uh, area, this half moon on her rear end, I said to them, yes, it is a pressure ulcer and it is directly related to a mechanical device, either a bedpan or a slipper pan that she's been left on for an extended period of time. So um, essentially that's what was documented, is that she came back from hospital. She did not have the injury when she left this facility. She returned with this particular tattoo on her rear end that it appears to be created by either slipper pan or a bed pan. It is a stage two pressure injury. And these are not devices that are used in this facility. So then they will take that forward and report it as a critical incident. So unfortunately that happens. It happens far too often. But if you don't look, you don't see, right? Um, completing that risk assessment. So the Braden scale is something that you guys routinely complete. But what I want you to think about is this is a scale for pressure ulcer prevention is to identify individuals at risk of injury. So when you think about completing that, when you look at sensation, think about all of the areas that it may affect. So have they got diabetes? Have they got neuropathic feet? Have they got hemiplegia? Have they have MS and had a change in sensation as a result of that MS? Again, I mentioned the dementia. I mentioned um, the sedation, those are all things, but someone in long-term excruciating pain, can they differentiate new pain related to pressure? Those things all put them at risk. Things like are, if they're in inactive and they're sitting, of course they're at more risk of pressure ulcers, right? Uh, if their nutrition is inadequate, any kind of moisture, because now if you couple friction with moisture, you think about yourself. If you've ever been in a hot tub and sat there till you got pruny, and now if you took and you rubbed your hand across the bottom of that foot, for example, what you will do is that skin will readily come off. So it just really increases the risk of tissue loss. And then, um, so, and friction of shear, of course. And shearing causes undermining. So when you see shear, you see undermining, which we're going to talk about more, but around a pressure ulcer, and it's, for example, going towards the coccyx, or sorry, from the coccyx towards the head, what's probably happening is that person's been pulled up in the bed, as I mentioned before, the head of the bed has been raised, and now they've gone slid down. And that dragging towards their head, that's the area of the shear. So wherever undermining is headed around a wound, that's the direction of, the, of where the shear and trauma is. So if it's at, at three o'clock or at nine o'clock, if it's sideways, it's because they're being dragged across the bed in that direction, and that's causing the tissue tear. So undermining is a key component of that assessment. Pressure management, turning and repositioning, we can't enforce that enough. There actually are no really strict guidelines for when we should turn people. The hallmark has always been every two hours. And do you know why it's every two hours? That's basically from way back in the day when they had about 40 bed nursing wards, 40 or 80 bed nursing wards. And basically the nurses would start at one end of the ward, go all the way down one end and all the way down the other. And it took them two hours to turn everybody and they turned around and came back again. That's the two hour window. It has no basis in research whatsoever because you can't ethically put somebody on a surface and leave them there for long enough to find out how long they break down. 
it's just not ethically allowed. So they're really, but two hours is the upper window, but if you've got somebody sitting in a chair on far smaller surface, they should be pressure shifting very routinely, probably every 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. So look at where they're, what they're doing, can they be shifting, how mobile are they, and Penny's going to talk all about pressure management, but things that are used are heel boots. I remember I mentioned the heel is very, it's very prone to injury, but it's also very hard to heal. And it's the one area of our body that we can completely float in space. Okay, so it's one that you can actually relieve pressure on. The special surfaces that are out there and things like the wheelchair cushions that are, we're going to talk about in a little while. So the things that can actually influence pressure are the proper inflation of a Rojo cushion. So one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later and actually demonstrate for you is how to do that. Because there is nothing worse than putting a $700 cushion or more on a chair and having someone overinflate it and create pressure. Because if you anything can create pressure if it's inappropriately used. So one of the things I found that I struggled with the most, and I was a home care nurse for many, many years, was trying to figure out whether or not cushions were appropriately inflated or properly inflated. And sometimes it was the, the client in that instance that would inflate it and pump it up because you know more has got to be better. <laughs> or it was the, um, the home health aide who just thought, well, I can't have them sinking into this darn thing. You know, it looks like it's flat, so they'd pump it up. And that caused more problems. Uh, than you want to know about. The proper placement. I actually was called to a long-term care facility several years ago, and it was simply because somebody had a new onset pressure ulcer. It was a horrific, horrific wound. It was um, a large area of black dead tissue. This poor little lady was all of about 90 pounds. It was, it, it was, it made me sick to look at it. and. What, when I went um, after and tried to figure out what the cause was, because it was quite a sudden onset, and we, I looked at the bed and we looked at all these other things, but it was definitively on her coccyx, which is typically lots of times from sitting. And I looked at the cushion in her wheelchair. It had been turned around backwards, and she was sitting on the pummel of that cushion and it caused an injury that she she was probably dead within a week of that injury it was just a horrific horrific injury so putting cushions in the wrong way can cause lots and lots of problems um, the use of incontinent products Penny's going to mention hammocking in, in the wheelchair, but hammocking also occurs on top of a cushion every layer you put between that individual and that pr that air filled or rojo cushion increases the pressure by about 25 percent because that incontinent pad does not allow them to be immersed in the in the cushion it actually stretch it doesn't stretch right the plastic on there could creates a stiff um, stiff surface that actually causes increased pressure so every incontinent pad that goes on every incontinent product that they're in every layer that we put between them and that rojo cushion decreases its ability to actually manage pressure. So we have to minimize those layers. And we really need to look at the, our partners, our occupational therapist that's part of the team. If something is changed, and you know, this came to me in spades the other day, as I, was, I do consult to a long-term care facility here in town, and what happens was they recognized that somebody with a pressure ulcer had gotten worse. They recognized and documented for two or three ch days that the wound was worse. They identified to me that it was worse, but I don't work there, and it took me a little time to get there. And when I arrived, it definitively was. It was now to the bone. And so when I looked at that wound, and it's on, it was on her ischial tuberosity, so she's sitting on it, and I looked at the change in that, I said to them, the first thing I did was walk over the wheelchair and, the, and said, what's wrong with her cushion? What had happened is she had a specialty cushion that had been created for her that was hard um, foam and a cutout in the center that was gel filled and then had a rojo sitting inside of it, just a small rojo cushion. The rojo cushion had shifted out of place and she was sitting directly on that hard foam. 
So I didn't know that that was in her cushion. It was a custom-made cushion. So when we took it apart and looked, and she said to me, oh, no, I don't have an air cushion, because my first thought was it's flat. Well, she, she didn't. It wasn't flat. It just wasn't in the right place. So if you see a resident in your care whose wound suddenly gets worse, look at what they're sitting on what they're laying on, what their feet are resting on, if that's the issue. Because pressure is what causes pressure ulcers. And when you see that, that's when you need to bring the team in, you need to bring in the OT, and that's what we did that day, is, was a cushion crisis. <laughs> we called them in to say, how can we get this fixed, and how can we get it checked? Because now she's in bed. We left her in bed. She wasn't very happy with me, but I said to her, really, you're unsafe in that chair. We obviously can't put you in that. That's unethical. We know what's causing damage. So you have to stay in bed until we can get someone out, one of the OTs out to check the cushion and figure out how to get, make it safe so that you can get up again. And we did. We did. But it's so important that we look. If we don't look, if we don't recognize that the, where the pressure source is, we're not going to solve the problem. Kathy? Thank you, Donna, for uh, your very informative presentation. Um, now, normally I would leave the questions till the very end, but we have had a few come in while you've been speaking. So uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes here and, and uh, ask a couple of questions because I think they're fairly mm -hmm. straightforward. Um, is uh, Tegaderm absorbent an option for skin tear or is the adhesive too much? I'm thinking they're talking about the clear acrylic absorbent and that is actually best practice according to the Canadian Association of Wound Care for skin tears, or, or sorry, level stage one and two pressure ulcers. Um, and that's simply because it's clear so you can see through it and it has something like a 21 day wear time. So it can be put in place and left in place for an extended period of time. But it has quite a harsh adhesive, and I frankly don't think I'd put it on a skin tear. Okay, thank you, Donna. And um, I'm just going to ask you one more here. A uh, question came in is, how long did you say adaptive can stay on for? Adaptic? Adaptic. Ad ad that's okay. Adaptic is, I change it every 24 hours. It, uh, Mepitel is a very different product from Adaptic. It's designed and... and when you're using products, I'm going to challenge you to actually read the manufacturer's directions in the packaging. They actually spend enormous amounts of resources on research to support the appropriate use of their product. The three, uh, sorry, the Malika company actually that makes Mepitel has directed us that it has efficacy for 14 days. The uh, Cystogenics has a, a I believe placed a 24 hour wear time on the Adaptic, but that's the reasoning for it. So when I would use Adaptic, I would use it on a very painful wound or so that I wanted a non-adherent dressing that because of infection risk, because I was putting, um, uh, you know, because of drainage or some other reason that I had to change every day, um, then I would put it on. But uh, the Mepitel <coughs> is the only one that can stay on longer.